and truth seekers, let's all rise to our feet. Let's worship God in this place. Come on. I know who I am.
Christ is enough for us. Christ is enough for us. Let's sing this out.
Thank you. 
You're the God that healeth you. That's what your word says. So we believe in you. We thank you. We claim your true. We pray that you speak to our hearts. In the name of Jesus, everybody said, Amen. Amen. Hello, Truth Seekers. Good to see you all. I wish I could see you in person. But thank God for technology that we could still worship together and praise God in this manner. I want to let you know that we are actively monitoring and receiving updates from the CDC, the California Public Health Department, and the Santa Clara County Public Health Department to look for guidelines as to how to respond and monitor through the spread of COVID-19. We encourage you to frequently wash your hands for at least 20 seconds with soap to refrain from meeting people, especially if you've traveled and have come from visiting countries that are listed on the CDC threat level three or above. And that includes countries uh, such as China, Italy, South Korea, and Iran at the moment. Now in this time of uncertainty, we encourage you to spread the beauty of Jesus and make him known. There are many people in our state that are facing stress, panic, and health issues. And we ask you as people who know and follow Jesus to be able to share with those who are in need, share your supplies, share your encouraging words, wisdom, and help. For those of you who know Jesus, we want to remind you that our God is a very present help in time of need. He is right with us. So there is no need for us to be anxious, to panic, or to worry that God's with us to help us and to deliver us from our situation. And in this time, could I encourage you to pray with me that God would intervene in our situations. God, we come to you and we acknowledge that in situations like this, it's hard not to be anxious. God, we pray that you would grant us your peace that we might trust and hope in you. We pray for those who are tirelessly working to help remedy the situation. You grant them wisdom and strength. We pray for many people who are suffering 
either the loss of their loved ones or physically suffering because of COVID-19. We pray for those who are suffering in our own congregation. I pray for speedy recovery for all of them and good health. We pray that your peace would rest upon us and guard us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So church, you know that recently we've been going through a new teaching collective called Dear Mind. Church, I have been excited to be doing this teaching collective. We've been working on this for months together and have put together an eight-week session going through the topics of our mind. And I personally treat this as not an ordinary teaching collective. This is going to be a transformative journey. I am inviting you all to partake in. By the end of this eight-week journey going through Dear Mind, I can promise that you're going to see yourself renewed and transformed, especially when it pertains to matters of the mind. As I've mentioned before, this teaching collective is going to be a two-part teaching collective, meaning that I'm going to be teaching on Friday nights on this particular topic, but we have in parallel a small group that meets during the week on either Tuesday nights or Wednesday nights. You could do it online or in person. All you need to do is sign up at the link that is displayed on your screens and you will be plugged right in to become part of a small group so we could apply what we are learning here on Friday nights at your convenience so you could be transformed by applying what we are learning here on Friday nights. Friends, Jesus wants us to change. But change is hard. See, Jesus loves us the way we are with all of our imperfections and failures. But Jesus also loves us in us to leave us the way we are. He's inviting us to be transformed into his likeness. But guess what? Change is not easy. Change takes work. Change is hard. And even if we desire to change, we don't even know where to start. Some of us don't want to change. Some of us want to stay the same. We want to be constant. But the mystery is, the only constant thing in the world is change. So it's up to us whether or not we're going to change right now or later. I encourage you that you would take this opportunity to work on transforming yourself as we go through this teaching collective, Dear Mind. Now the topic of my message tonight, the title is Date Yourself. Date Yourself. Yes, you heard me right. Date yourself. Church, we are living in a time and a season where everyone's dating everybody. Do you know what's the latest dating app? Well, don't worry. Even if you don't know, there's going to be a new one tomorrow. There's going to be another new one the day after. It doesn't matter. Man, people are dating all the time. There are so many people to date and so little time. But I wonder if these people that are dating, if they know who they themselves are in the first place. I mean, these people are going around trying to meet people, get to know them, date them with the potential of doing life together with them. But I wonder if they have dated themselves in the first place, if they are in tune with the reality of who they are on their inner selves. Are they familiar with their own thoughts, with their own mindsets, with their own emotions, with their own feelings? Are they in tune with themselves? I want you to think for a moment. You see, we have grown up learning to imitate. Since the time we were born, we didn't know how to eat, we didn't know how to communicate, to talk. We didn't know how to walk and use our feet. But we have learned to do these things by observing our parents, by observing people around us. We've imitated them to help us learn to do these things. 
But unfortunately, we carry out this pattern of imitating others even after we grow up. We have this desired projected self that others would approve of, that others would desire to see that we project. Although, truly speaking, that's not our inner self. So we live in this dichotomy between our projected outward self versus our true inward self. And this dichotomy brings us to a place where we are constantly living a life where we haven't dated ourselves. We are living in this life where we are not in tune, familiar with who we are on the inside. You might have grown up hearing many of these phrases that tell us to quench who we are, to repress our feelings, our emotions. Did you hear the phrase growing up something like, you know, real men do not cry. Real men do not cry. If you look at the Bible, we find Jesus wept. Jesus shed tears. Well, there it goes. Do real men not cry? Well, some of you know Roger Federer. Roger Federer is one of my heroes. Many of you like him for his exceptional ability to play tennis. But the reason I like Roger Federer is because, man, this person cries. He knows how to cry in front of camera. He can be himself when he's facing millions of people that are watching him online. He cries. Real men don't cry. And this is just one example of a person who is in tune with himself. He knows his emotions and he's comfortable enough to express them to be in a place where he doesn't have to live in this dichotomy between what others would project him to be versus what and who he is on the inner side. And if this dichotomy is not addressed, if we are not truly working on knowing and dating ourselves in the inside, this can result in serious issues. In fact, this scenario has been played out really well in a recent movie titled Joker. If you haven't watched the movie Joker, I encourage you to watch the movie to become familiar with what might happen if the dichotomy between your inner self is not addressed between your inner self and your external projected self. In this movie Joker, we meet his protagonist, Arthur Fleck. Arthur Fleck was a stand-up comedian, however, a failed one. And he walked through the streets of Gotham City trying to relate to the people on the streets. He struggled to make connections with people and he himself had a mental disability that made him laugh uncontrollably. He also ended up living with his single mom who was also struggling just as he was struggling. That was his life. And as he lived this life, Arthur Fleck had to wear two masks. One mask he would wear for his day job as a clown. He would dress up to make people laugh. But while he was doing this day job, his projected self, he also had this inner self that he really wanted to relate with other people. So he would wear this other mask where he was trying to please people and relate to them the way he naturally was, only to see his attempts become futile. As the story would go, that this dichotomy continues to unfold in his life in a series of steps, slowly transforming Arthur Fleck into a mad maniac and a criminal. Unless we address this dichotomy of a projected self versus our true inner self, we have to look at serious consequences that would result in our lives being lived that way. Church, that's why we are doing this teaching collective, Dear Mind, that we would learn to work on our minds, to be able to be transformed into how fullness of our life being lived out. A passage of scripture comes to mind when I think about this inner self. We find the apostle Paul writing in the book of Ephesians, he goes on to say, 
to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. This passage, if you read it, well, essentially, it's talking about these two selves, this old self, which probably is corrupt, and this new self, which is Christ-like. And this passage invites us to being transformed by putting off our old self and then putting on our new self. Now, let me ask you, how would one put off their old self, their own self, if they are not familiar with their own self? How would one put away their own self if they don't really know what their own self is? If they're not in tune with their emotions, with their thoughts, with their mindsets, with their feelings, their own self, how are you ever going to put it out? And then put on a new self. When I was growing up, I was refer to this particular passage of scripture where it talks about putting off this old self and putting on the new self. Someone said it to me like this. Well, you can think about this verse like putting off a jacket and putting on a new jacket. Well, your old self is like one pair of clothing, maybe a jacket that you can take off and then you can put on the new self, which is a new jacket. And if we were to do something like that, well, I could imagine myself taking off this old self, my own self, and then putting on a new self, which is Christ-like self, which is putting on a new jacket. Well, only to realize that this jacket wouldn't fit. And I realized that Although this jacket looks good, pleasant to wear, I just can't fit myself in this particular jacket. And I see that I have a bunch of belly fat here. I have weird proportions in my body that needs to be set right so I could fit myself in this new jacket. Well, if this jacket is Christ-like nature, how am I ever going to fit myself in this new jacket, this Christ-like nature? Well, you know what we most often might end up doing? Well, we still try to fit ourselves in this new self, in this new Christ-like self. However, we can't get it all the way around. So we decide to fit ourselves somehow in part, not in whole. Put on this jacket in my hand and try to have this new self in part. Some of us, you might be going to church and you put on this Christ-likeness in part. You do that on Sundays. You do that when there are people around you. You say Christ-like things when you are praising God, when you are worshiping, when you are praying, you put on this Christ-likeness upon yourself. But on the inside, on your true self, you don't have this new self. You are still struggling deep inside, denying your true self that has never put off. What does it take to put on a new self? Well, it's much harder than just putting off a jacket and then putting on a new jacket. It means I got to work on my body. It means that I got to take an inventory. I got to quantify. I got to know how much fat I need to lose. I got to know how much work I need to put in to get in shape to put on a new jacket. Putting off your old self and putting on your new self. Well, what is also interesting we find is that this kind of putting off your old self and putting on your new self is not going to happen right away. It's not going to happen that you listen to a sermon, that you listen to my message like this, and overnight that you're going to put on a new self, which is Christ-like self. This thing takes work. We can't expect to buy a pair of dumbbells and put them in the corner of our home, and then lo and behold, tomorrow you have biceps. 
Well, you got to get off that couch. You got to put on your gym clothes. And you got to work out, lift those weights. Day in and day out. Constantly working so you could have a new self that is Christ-like self. If you go back to the scripture passage, what is interesting is the scripture passage never says put off and put on. Well, that's just our Instagram, Instacart, Insta-read reading of the scripture. If you go back, it says to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires and to be renewed in your spirit of your minds. It's not just putting off and then going ahead and putting on a new self. You got to be renewed in the spirit of your minds. You got to work to be able to fit. You got to work to be able to put on this new self. And unless you work upon yourself, you could never truly put on your new self. This renewal in the spirit of your mind, being renewed, being transformed by the renewal of our minds is what this teaching collective is exactly about. Man, this thing takes time. This thing con- takes concentrated effort and dedication and working on our minds. And this thing doesn't happen overnight. Think about it. If it takes 18 years, if it takes 18 years for us to be born and to think like an adult, we can't expect to think like Jesus overnight. If we need 18 years after birth to think like an adult, we can't expect to think like Jesus overnight. We got to work. We got to be renewed in our minds and we got to put things in practice to be transformed to put on the new self. Let me share a personal story with you. I've been working in my lab, my workspace, and I've been noticing there's a lot of work that's been on my plate. And I thought it would be helpful for me to hire a college grad to help me with some of the work I've been doing in the lab. Now, I hired this new person a few weeks ago, and I've been excited to have more productivity at my workplace. I soon found out that my excited enthusiasm for the new hire slowly changed into disappointment and has actually become a bit of a nightmare for me. I've been noticing how I was unable to get this particular coworker of mine to follow instructions. I would tell this person to do particular things only to come back and find out that she didn't do it. We would try to work the situation, and I often would find myself getting frustrated and angry over this person. However, as a pastor, as a well-behaved Christian, I'm not allowed to become angry. I'm not allowed to vent my frustration over her. And I begin to wonder if I made a wrong choice in hiring this particular person. Now, if this situation were two years ago, I would go back home and I would vent my anger with my brother or with my family. I myself would have been this totally different person when I would come back home. At my workspace, at my co-worker's desk, and this nice, well-behaved Pastor Sam. But then when I come back home, my self is so corrupt full of anger and hatred for my co-worker. Now that I've been working on my own mind, I've realized that i got to stop. I can't just go ahead this way, living a double life, where I live one way with my co-worker, and then I come back home and I vent my anger, I vent my frustration on others. And I begin to stop and ask myself, Why am I becoming angry? Instead of ignoring or denying my feeling of anger or hatred for my coworker, I begin to ask myself, what is it that's making me angry? Have I set the expectations right with my coworker? Am I expecting more than what she could deliver? 
How about my coworker? Is she finding threatened at my workplace? Am I creating a toxic work culture at my workplace? And as I've been asking these questions, it helped me realize that there are many things I could work on. There are many small changes I could do about my own approach to my relationship with my coworker that can result in better outcomes. But this can only happen if I pause. And if I take an inventory of all my thoughts, my feelings, my emotions, and my behavior patterns. It can only happen when I pause. And when I say, I want to work on my mind. I want to renew my mind so I could improve this relationship. So I could be true to who I am in my inward self. Now there is a, a way to think about this particular pattern of renewing ourselves. There is this term that's called differentiation, a term that has been coined, coined by Murray Bowen. Murray Bowen, he is the one who invented this modern family systems theory and has been widely known for analyzing behavior patterns, especially in the context of living a self that is different from the self outside. His concept of differentiation could be understood as to how one could hold on to the things that they truly are in the midst of pressures and expectations that are placed upon them by other people. If you could imagine a scale of zero to 100, this ability of differentiation could be measured anywhere from the low end, zero, to the high end, 100. It includes things such as how you are able to separate your goals and your desires from those of the pressures that are placed upon you while still being together with the people that are important to you. And people who are at the low end of the scale, they could be people who suffer with low self-esteem, or care for approval of others, while people who are on higher end of the scale, close to 75 to 100, these are people who are self-aware, who know themselves, and are able to navigate life by being truly authentic to who they are. Now, I'm going to read out a few of these behavior patterns that are typical of those who are on the lower end of the scale. And as I read out these behavior patterns, I want you to take inventory of where you stand. Are you struggling with any of these behavior patterns that might mean that you have a low differentiation scale? So, well, the first one we're going to look at is you are unable to distinguish between fact and feeling. Well, you might be in a place where you are driven by your emotions. You are driven by your knee-jerk reaction. You are unable to pause. You are unable to stop and differentiate from what your emotions versus what your facts. In fact, this idea of differentiation helps us to see both feelings and facts are our thinking and reasoning and feelings as two sides of the coin that are both needed to be balanced to have a true assessment of ourselves and of the situation. Well, the second one we find, do you see yourself being emotionally needy and always reactive to those around you? Do you find yourself being in a place where you need emotional approval, where you need others to help you with your own emotional stability? Well, if that is you, you are probably on the low end of the scale. When others come at you, are you able to withhold your emotions, withhold your feelings, and not react to every situation that you might come across with? Well, let's move on. Well, maybe, are you always seeking others' approval? Are you always finding yourself drawn to asking, what do people think about me? How do they esteem me? How high of an opinion others have about me? This is one thing we struggle a lot, 
especially in this age of social media. We put out stuff, we project ourselves to other people to give a self that we would expect others to approve of, something that they would hold in high regard. Is there something you might be struggling with, which might mean you have a low differentiation scale according to the Bowen's uh, theory? Well, another one is you probably find very few goal-directed activities in your life. You are not working on your own agenda, vision, and goals you have set up for yourself. You're constantly led to think what others might think, what they would expect from you, what they would desire you to be like. It's hard for you to have your own agenda, have your own plan and a purpose, a sense of identity and destiny for where you want to get to in your life, but rather you're constantly wavering left and right. And finally, are you struggling with transitions? Are you finding it hard to always manage change? Especially when you find yourself in a place that you're not familiar with. Maybe you've traveled to a new city. Maybe you are in a new work environment. Maybe you are suffering the loss of a loved one. These are transitions that happen to us in our life or in a time like this where there is crisis around us. And are you finding yourself being anxious, being worried, or finding yourself in a state of fear and panic? Well, if that's so, then there is a lot of work that we need to be doing. So we could grow in our ability to differentiate, to grow in our differentiation potential according to this Bowen scale. How are we going to do that? Like I said, church, the only way we can do this is by working on our minds, is by getting to the root of what the issues are, by taking an inventory of where we are, how we are struggling with. And I highly encourage you to consider joining the small group to make this practical and to work upon it. When we look at helping others, encouraging others, loving others the way we would love ourselves, how could we truly do that when we ourselves are not in tune with who we are? I earnestly believe the best gift we can give to others is our true loving self that is in love with ourselves and with God. Many of you know the story of Jesus. If you look at the story of Jesus, we find a man who has been selfless, who has never been selfish, but at the same time, who has always kept his own integrity has known what his vision was, has known his own agenda that he has come to accomplish in this world. We find in Jesus a person where many demands and expectations were placed on his life. How he got to behave, what he got to do, how he has to relate to others around him, the kinds of things Jesus had to do, the kinds of miracles people expected to see of him. But we find in Jesus a person who knew himself, a person who was in tune with what he needed to accomplish in this world. And I encourage you to compare your life to that of Jesus. Do you find yourself constantly struggling with approval of people, constantly struggling with your emotions, not having your whole self together, having integrity in your life? Well, if that is the case, I invite you in this journey to work on your minds and to be transformed by the renewing of your minds. And I don't know where you are, friend. If you do not have Jesus in your life, you can never be truly self-aware. You can never truly know yourself. Because we are created to be in the image of God. We are created to be in the likeness of God. To have the same thoughts, to have the same feelings, and to have the same emotions and actions that our God has. And without the help of Jesus in our lives, we could never be true to ourselves. And if you do not have Jesus, I don't want to leave you without an opportunity. Make Jesus your personal Lord and Savior. I encourage you to pray with me a very simple prayer inviting Jesus into your heart. Would you pray with me? 
Jesus, I acknowledge that I cannot be true to myself, realize myself without having you in my life. So Jesus, I welcome you into my life. Would you come be my Lord? I confess that I fall short and that I am a sinner and I invite you into my heart. In Jesus' name, I pray. Now, friend, if you've prayed that prayer, the Bible tells us that you have begun a relationship with Jesus. Why not join a Bible-based church, grow in your faith, and explore the fullness of life that Jesus has come to offer you. And until we see you again, God bless you.